I know there's a whole bunch of different pillars when it comes to metabolic health we haven't gone deep into. We went really deep into the food piece, and that's the foundation. They're all foundational. I don't want to minimize any of them, but that is a staple piece that people can begin to make changes in today. So I'm glad we went deep into that. What I'd like to do, if you're good with this, is quickly go through what the other pillars are, or at least a handful of them, and get into some of the more important points there. And then maybe we can have a round two down the line, basically steer mostly away from food because we've covered that so deeply and get into all these other pillars because they are so important. I want to make sure we we do justice. But before we part ways, can we can we just get a little tidbit of these different pillars and the highlights of each? Sure, absolutely. I'll just list them and maybe one actionable tip that people can can do um, to help optimize metabolic health. So we talked about food in depth. The next one would be sleep. Aim for seven or eight hours per night. In epidemiologic studies, this seems to be the key amount that we need for optimal metabolic health. We want to try and have as much consistency in sleep as possible. So that means going to bed and getting up at the same period of time, because that really feeds into our circadian rhythms, which actually define uh, some of our metabolic processes. Our bodies kind of work on a biologic clock. And so we want to sleep and eat ideally in as regular uh, windows as possible. This is the one I'm absolutely the worst at. I'm like, I bounce around all the time on what time I go to bed. But unfortunately, I do see it on my continuous glucose monitor. So when I go to bed late, I'm going to see usually higher glucose levels the next day. Sleep deprivation um, increases our cortisol levels, and it also increases, it it disturbs our satiety hormones. So we actually often will crave more carbohydrate-rich foods because of the way sleep impacts our ghrelin and our leptin levels. So when you're sleeping, you're investing in less cravings the next day, which I think is really powerful. Um, And there's one last tidbit on sleep. Um, You can take a group of healthy non-diabetic individuals and sleep deprive them for six days, give them just four hours of sleep per night, and you can turn them into people with prediabetes. So it is just a small amount of sleep deprivation that can totally perturb your insulin sensitivity. In that particular study that I'm talking about, they then gave them as much sleep as they wanted after that intervention. And of course, things you know, bounced back and got better, but you don't want to be putting your body under that type of stress. So that's sleep. The next one is exercise. The key things I'd say about exercise is that movement is critical for optimal metabolic health because when we're moving our muscles, we're creating a glucose sink and we're moving more glucose channels to the receptors of our cells to take that glucose out of the bloodstream and process it. Exercise also improves mitochondrial biogenesis. So we're actually getting more of these energy factors to process, um, to process that glucose. All different types of exercise have been studied, and it it would be way too simplistic to say there's one particular type of exercise that's optimal for metabolic health because yoga, zone two, low intensity training, high intensity interval training, resistance training, and walking have all been extensively studied, and they all help. (laughs) So, um, so it's kind of like do do something at a bare minimum, and and maybe in another episode we can go deep into like each of those types of exercise and what we know about. Um, how it affects mitochondrial health and mitochondrial capacity, because it's really fascinating. But the key takeaway I'd say is, if you can do one thing differently in your life, it's incorporate more movement throughout the day. So not just focusing on one workout at the end of the day, which is great if you're doing that, but actually trying to do two minutes of physical activity every 30 minutes throughout the day. Because in research, they've shown that if you have people just even walk or jog for a minute and 40 seconds to two minutes every half hour, they have lower 24-hour glucose and insulin levels than people who walk the exact same amount of time, but in one chunk at the end of the day. So I keep a kettlebell right next to me in the in my office. I have a treadmill desk usually underneath this desk. And so I'm trying to, that's been a big unlock for me studying this research is that it's moving more frequently that is is really, really useful. Our bodies are intended to move. They're not intended to sit for 14 hours a day. And the way I see it is it's like, it's kind of use it or lose it. If these pathways are inactive all day, except for 30 minutes or an hour, they're kind of just like, it's all just atrophying during the day. You want to, even if you're just sparking it for a minute or two minutes, you're still keeping all those pathways active. So move more during the day can be super low intensity. Just do something, few air squats, dance around your office, kettlebell, walk around your house. Um, so the next pillars we've covered now, food, sleep, exercise is stress. We've talked extensively about stress in this episode. So I think the key takeaway I would say is 
more deep diaphragmatic breaths. And what I mean by diaphragmatic breaths is a breath where you're breathing in and your belly goes out because your diaphragm, which is the muscle that that goes down when your lungs inhale, is like pushing the belly down and you want to see your belly expand. The reason that's important is because the diaphragm is connected to the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is really this nerve of relaxation, the nerve of parasympathetic nervous activity, the nerve that's going to release the hormones that tell your body that you're safe. So when you're breathing in, flattening that diaphragm, expanding the belly, stimulating the vagus nerve, you're literally giving your body a neurochemical signal that your body is safe. And that's going to, of course, feed into that downstream cortisol and the sort of threat signaling that ultimately is going to keep our blood sugar elevated. The next one is microbiome. We've also talked about this quite extensively. So that's the the key points here are making sure you're getting the multiple servings of probiotic rich food per day, making sure you're getting the prebiotic food. So like the actual fiber I am for 50 grams a day, Um, making sure you're getting colorful diversity of plants. So the the American Gut Project recently showed that people who got more than 30 different types of plants per week had better microbiome diversity than people who had less than um, 30. And, uh, or sorry, less than 10 in that study. So it was kind of looking at people with less than 10 or more than 30. Above 30 was really the magic number for having the better population. So I would implore you to in this coming week, count how many different types of fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, types you're getting per week and aim for 30. It's really not hard. I'm now shooting to get above 20 in a single meal. And if you start doing that, I mean, it's just, it's like a field day for your gut. So probiotics, prebiotics, diversity, and then take out the stuff that hurts the microbiome. So this is the pesticides. This is the refined grains and the refined sugars. Um, these are the things. And and then one other thing is excess antibiotics, of course, and excess pain relievers like Advil. So NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, of which Advil is one, um, these can actually cause problems with our microbiome. And of course, excess antibiotics is going to kill the mi- a lot of the, the microbiome. And so the if, if antibiotics are you need them for bacterial infection, of course, take them, but we're way overusing them right now. We're both overusing anti-inflammatory medications and antibiotics. So limit them if you can. And then the last, um, the last, uh, couple to talk about is environmental toxins and light exposure. And I'll run through those really quickly with environmental toxins. We're thinking about things that either like are disrupting the microbiome, like I said, so things that are going in and hurting our beautiful gut bacteria that do so much for our metabolic health, but also things that are disrupting our actual mitochondrial function and causing damage to our energy factories. There's a fascinating paper that came out just a couple months ago. One of our advisors, Dr. Rob Lustig, who's been on your podcast, um, was a lead author on this paper, and it, it it was about obesogens, which are a class of environmental chemicals now that we know directly lead to obesity. So it used to be that there was a like correlation between toxins and obesity. And we now know mechanistically that these are actually causing obesity in part because of what they're doing to our mitochondria. The crazy thing is that these obesogens, which are a type of endocrine disrupting environmental chemical, these are largely industrial chemicals that are basically unregulated. Like they have very little oversight. You can create something for an industrial product and put it in your product and kind of do it willy nilly. This is insane. So stuff that obesogens are in, personal care products, makeup, deodorant, shampoo, conditioner, home care products, um, our cleaning sprays, our dish soap, our laundry detergent. It's in our mattresses, our furniture, our electronics. It's in our in the ink that's on the receipts we get from the store. It's in car exhaust. It's in our air. It's in our water. Um, It's in the fragrance in our candles. It's everywhere. We're talking about hundreds of chemicals. It's in plastics, plasticizers, clothes. You know, polyester is plastic. (laughs) Like, and now of course we're seeing polyester in our I'm sorry, um, microplastics in our food and our, our water, and then it's pesticides. So 
clean living, I mean, gosh, this could be a whole nother episode, but like figuring out ways to avoid as many of these as possible is, is so important. So that could be filtering your air, filtering your water, organic food, knowing your farmer, um, trying to buy non-toxic materials, organic cotton, organic bamboo, clothing, et cetera. Um, and the last one is light. Light is so interesting because while food is molecular information that goes into the body, light is energetic um, information that goes into the body. And so you really think about light almost as food in a different way because it's stimulating your body in that in, 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 in as direct of a way as food. And so when light goes into your retina and hits your photoreceptor cells in the retina, it's sending a signal to this part of your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And that's really the top-down control over the, the clock genes in the body that um, that set up how a lot of our core processes in the body unfold throughout the day. So if you're having erratic, what's called sometimes in the science, erratic photic signals, um, so basically like light at times that we weren't normally supposed to get light during the day, like at night, for instance, through blue light and through our computers, it's totally confusing those clock genes in the body and that circadian rhythm of the body and can have an impact on our, our metabolism. So we want to be getting, practically speaking, wake up, first thing you do, go outside and look at the sky for a few minutes, two minutes. What I usually do is when I'm brushing my teeth in the morning, I always open the door and stand outside when I'm doing it. And I stare at the sky, no sunglasses, get that light that says to your body, it is morning. For so many of us working at home now, you might not go outside until like mid afternoon. And so, and and the light that comes to the windows is not even close to as strong as what you get from direct sunlight. So you want to go outside, look at the sun, tell the body it's morning. And then ideally towards the end of the day, ideally move away from your devices, but that's really impractical for most of us. So, you know, wear the red tinted, orange tinted glasses to hopefully block some of the blue light starting after dinner or so. You don't want to necessarily wear the blue light blocking glasses throughout the whole day because you want your body to know it's daytime during the day. But as you move towards nighttime, if you're going to be looking at your screens, have some blue light blocking glasses. So, so light is actually one that is so overlooked. That's really quite important. And people who are exposed to blue light late at night have uh, worse metabolic outcomes. Um, this is another one that I'm actively working on in my, <laughs> my life right now. But so that's kind of the overview, food, sleep, exercise, stress, microbiome, um, environmental toxins and light exposure that are our actionable levers to improve our metabolic health and really speak to how holistic this is. It's not one thing that I think is missing. And sometimes the conversation about metabolic health is that we get in this mindset or we hear this mindset that just by going low carb will make you metabolically healthy. But I think what we've sort of seen as we've talked through all these different levers of metabolic health is that it is so much more complex than that. You can't build a metabolically healthy body by removing just one micronutrient. You have to build a metabolically healthy body by tapping into all the different levers of metabolic health consistently day in and day out to really foundationally um, build sort of a, a structurally and functionally sound system. And so while low carb can be a thread of a comprehensive strategy, it never is going to be the one thing that builds an optimally functioning machine. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. If you are an American born today, you are on a direct trajectory towards having a blood sugar problem, having metabolic dysfunction and having insulin resistance. And this will increase.